Hello and welcome to another episode of Midiara Meets, the monthly music podcast where we talk to a wide range of people from the music scene. This month I'm speaking to John Astley, who's had a phenomenal career as a mastering engineer, working with the biggest artists in the world, including The Who, ABBA, George Harrison and many, many more. John cut his teeth in the early days as an engineer for the likes of David Bowie and the Eagles, and in the 90s went on to have a solo career of his own. John's still mastering to this day and now offers a reduced rate for anyone who's unsigned to have their tracks mastered through his incredible setup. I caught up with John earlier this year to talk about his career and my first question was about his musical beginnings. Um, well, my father was quite a famous 60s composer, uh, Ted Astley, Edwin Astley, and he wrote music for The Saint and a lot of the t- and Robin Hood and stuff. A lot of the TV stuff that you saw on um, independent television in, uh, in the 60s. So he used to take me to one or two recordings, um, mostly on sound stages. So, and I think the very first one I went to is actually, I remember him asking for to run a wax disc because they recorded to optical film and you couldn't play back optical film. Mm-hmm. So if you wanted to listen to something back, you had to run a disc at the same time or a, a, you know, a, and a piece of acetate or something and, uh, and then you could play it back in the control room. So yeah, um, I went to the, uh, some vivid memories of, of like the Danger Man recordings with the harpsichord and um, Randall and Hopkirk, and it was uh, interesting, and that yeah, and I got interested in being in the control rooms and uh, and seeing what they were doing. So it started early. Mm. And d- do you feel like there was a process of osmosis in some way that you picked up from being there? Um, I don't know because I really was my heart was in film, and I went off to to and I did three years of making films at um, Oxford Poly. Well, in my last year, I made films, and. Um, and I really wanted to get into the film industry and to eventually direct. But the film industry was dead. On its, it was on its knees. This is about early 70s, 71 or 72. Um, it was before all the Star Wars had come along. All the technical stuff had, um, had be, hadn't been invented. So really, like Pinewood and um, Elstree and places were on their knees and closing left, right and centre, Ealing closed, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I was offered a job on cameras in... Um, at ATV in Birmingham because they were still running 16 mil news uh, footage. Wow. <laughs> and um, I could see that it, as soon as everybody else was running video, I thought, I thought well, this is gonna, it's not going to be a very long life. Was, you know, and I didn't really want to live in Birmingham. My heart, my heart was in down here. Mm-hmm. I wanted to live in London. And what was it that drew you to film in those early days? Um, Why did you want to be involved in that? I don't know. I just love the medium and um, it's very exciting. And I made some really nice little films, one of which is in the British Film Institute um, archives. Nice. Made a film for the Family Planning Association. They came to me and asked me to do it while I was in my last year. And um, but the the big dif- the big difference was at the end of my three years when I came out of college that most people had said my soundtrack sounded better than my films looked. <laughs> <laughs> so. Maybe the writing was on the wall at that point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If people are saying that to you, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, I have a similar. I have a similar aspiration. I love film too. I have, yeah, it's it's definitely in this form of escapism from music for me. This film and um, yeah, yeah, I'd love to direct the film with it, and I can't really explain why either. Um, you did work on Quadrophenia, though. Is that correct? I think you have a credit working on the film Quadrophenia. Um, only on the soundtrack. Or was that on the soundtrack? I think so. Um, I did. That could be. Yeah. I remember visiting Pete and going out and recording outboard motors and stuff. Uh, we, yeah, we had. Um, he had a um, little stereo uh, Stella box, I think it was, or maybe it was the uh, reel to reel machine, and we we went out and recorded bit sound bits of background noise and stuff. And the pebbles on the beach at the beginning of Quadrophenia, that, that was um, recorded by him. Wow. So, and we're just walking up and down the beach and doing stuff, you know. 
That must have felt really cool in those in those days to be able to take a machine to record things like yeah an engine or a motor and it not a conventional an instrument in a studio yeah without power as well you know with a little battery pack which is great quite yeah. exciting so yeah um, Pete did all the sound effects for it and the train go you know coming past in five fifteen that sort of stuff I think that was recording gory. Um, where the whole of Quadrophenia was put together. When they mixed it, they had eight-track cartridges with the sound effects on them, like they do, like they had at the BBC. Mm -hmm. So that, as they mix, they they throw the cartridge in for the sound effects at the right at the right moment. Really, and yeah. then it triggers, and and it, it got added to the mix as it went along. Yeah. That's cool. Which was really exciting because no, I don't think anybody had done that. Yeah. And Pete mixed it in four-track as a quadraphonic experiment. And he had, uh, and Dolby came, um, the guy from Dolby came down and they did some encoding and stuff to try and, early, it was early surround sound experiments really, to try and carry four tracks over a, st over a two track, mm -hmm. with a, some sort of matrix encoding going on. So yeah. yeah, interesting stuff. And when you say Pete, that's Pete Townsend? Townsend yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. I've known him all my life, well, I've known him since 65. Since the first single, anyway, can't explain, mm -hmm. which he gave to me. Did he? <laughs> That's brilliant. He was he was married to your sister. He was married to my sister time. for a while. Yeah. 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 That's brilliant. It's brilliant that you had. I mean, you must have so many recollections. Of oh yeah, and he took me to gigs. He was very very sweet. Whether he was just trying to keep my mum dead happy, I don't know. <laughs> it always helped <laughs> doing that sort of thing. But yeah, he drove me to gigs. So amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's in his old house, where, where we're, we're, that? we're set in his old house. Oh, and this yeah. room, um, uh, Thunderclap knew him something in the air, a lot of the work for that was done in, in this room. Really? Yeah. Wow. With Andy Newman and Speedy Keen, Jimmy McCulloch. Do you remember Jimmy McCulloch? He, he joined Wings, he was the guitarist in Wings. Oh, right, okay. Right. I just, I just know Ian McCulloch in the music world, which yeah. is uh, Echo and the Bunny Man. Yeah, different, different family. Yeah. <laughs> Probably related. <laughs> That's brilliant. So um, you started out as a tape operator yeah. in, in the early 70s. So. I had a job at uh, Radio Luxembourg for a, a few days and they asked me, um, a friend asked me to drop by and see him at the Red Lion in Barnes on my way home. So I did that. He introduced me to Keith Grant. Keith Grant was the manager of Olympic Studios and I knew about Olympic because talking to Pete, Pete had been working there. They'd done who's who's a lot who's next there with, with Glyn John, mm -hmm. and um, so I really got on with Keith, and um, I I said you know I'd, I'd give my right arm to work with you, and, and I hear you've got some new twenty four track machines arriving, you know, and he said yeah, he said um, when could you start? And I said Monday, and he went right. So I gave them very short notice at Radio Luxembourg, and I started <laughs> work at Olympic, and. Um, which is okay in those days, nobody seems to bat an eyelid. Um, but you you make tea, basically, and look after clients. Very early on, I got into setting up microphones for everybody, making sure they all worked before a jingle session. Jingle sessions used to start at sometimes 8 in the morning. Mm -hmm. So you'd be in there at 7, setting up microphones, putting the chairs out. You, you knew what the line, you'd give them a line-up, you know, four brass, two strings, whatever. And you set it all up, the engineer and and then the rec and then the um, advertising company would come in, and hopefully all the faders would work. The 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 thing was, it really had to work because a thirty second jingle, you didn't get long to balance it. It was like bang wallop, you know, throw the faders up, make sure everything's going to tape. Yeah, I uh, suppose a, j a jingle's a very concentrated piece of music. And it's over, isn't it's it? over in seconds. So yeah, you, you don't have long to yeah to work at it. Exactly. Well, I've never heard of a jingle session before, uh, but it, it totally makes sense that you'd need to do that. Um, I, it was in, it was interesting, um, and, and voiceovers and stuff like that, you know, we'd had the, the guy who did all the film work, he was Canadian, and he used to come in and go, caffeine, and he had his voice down here, you know, <laughs> on the 4th of July. <laughs> and um, and I met uh, Ross McManus, who, who did... Um, who sang a lot of jingles? He was um, Elvis Costello's dad, hmm. and he was the, like the R White's ads. I, did, I I worked on those R White's Lemonade and stuff. And, and oh, all uh, right, yeah. cool. Are, they, are you st are you credited for those? No, in no, some no, way no, that no. They're not. I was, I, most, I was mostly an assistant on them. I didn't really start to do 
engineering until I'd met Lynn. Mm -hmm. And uh, although I no, I did engineer for David Bowie. Um, he he wanted um, he we were working on Diamond Dogs. I was just the assistant, but we really got on well. And he wanted um, Lulu to come in and do a vocal on Man Who Sold the World, but he wanted to go clubbing. So he said, you can look after this, John, can't you? I said, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Never done, never done any engineering, live engineering before in my life. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done mixing in, you know, because I used to drag up with the Eagles Masters and try and remix them on my own late at night, you know, that sort of thing. Excellent. But anyway, Lulu came in, did that, went to number one. I thought, oh, doddle with, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So and then um, the Glyn, the Glyn Johns things was very was very interesting because um, he's he was known as a bit of a tyrant. He would he's, he's very quick tempered, you know, short tempered uh, sometimes. Although he never was with me. And um, he his usual assistant um, suddenly phoned in ill one afternoon, and the studio were, the girls at the studio were running around like headless chickens, going, "What are we going to do? What are we going to do?" And I said, "I'll do it." And they said, yeah, but you, will you? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'd love to do it. I'd love to work with you, you know. So they went, okay, on your head be it. Off you <laughs> go. And, um, and we really hit it off. And he, he asked for me of all future sessions. And he started taking me to other studios. And we went to America together and worked. And uh, it was great. It was about four or five years together. And we did work with Eric Clapton and the Eagles and lots of stuff. You mentioned in an interview that he had he had a, a knowledge to know when the best take was coming. Yeah, you could say. How is that possible? Like, where did that come from? What? You just hear it all come together. And it's like when you work with an orchestra. It's, all, it's usually the third take, that, that, or the third run through is the take. Because they'll run it down where they, they're learning the parts in orchestra. And then the second time they run it through, they're beginning to listen to what's going on around them. And then the third time they run it through, they they perform it, and they and they, the whole thing becomes sweet because they they they're tuning in with everyone and what's going on around them. Mm. And the same sort of thing does happen in the studio when you've got four or five guys playing together. Um, I mean, it can go on for hours. The, the Stones were just were hopeless. They they <laughs> they start work at about midnight and try and get a take and usually they go back and listen to the first one they did and they go oh yeah well, you know what on earth were we do are we doing you know chasing their chasing their asses mm -hmm. but they go on all night but which Glyn would never do Glyn would only work to about midnight and stop generally just said nothing nothing of any note is going to happen from this point and <laughs> and it's something I, t I took on board and started to do with people and, and my engineer co-producer that I'd worked with um in later years, used to say to me, you, you know, I think you stopped the session too soon. I said, yeah, well, he says, I know what you mean. You're not going to get any, anything done, but the, it upsets the band, you know, because yeah. they think they're about, they think they're about to get there. But I, yeah, I, I maybe always thought, I always thought it was a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps in the mindset of the musician, yeah. they're always getting better like every take is absolutely leading on a path to a better place yeah yeah but yeah i made perhaps the oversight that you have you're able to say let's call it a day <laughs> call it a day come in fresh definitely don't, don't come in you know after a, a night of trying to get something you're not going to get yeah oh well and but so, yeah yeah so glenn and i had a great time together and and he he i did let well sometimes he wasn't even there but he let me engineer stuff here, here and there so i, I got to got on the controls a bit and then 78 it was with who are you he walked out on that and the who asked me to as producer to finish it as producer mm. yeah i mean there's a lot of stories about that album that i've read uh uh including it being the last one that they'd made with keith moon that's right yeah um and him getting kicked out of the band during the recording and then coming back Sort himself out, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's and also an interesting story about you, uh, Glyn, not being around one day and you mic'd up the drum kit with 
Oh, that's before that's before Glyn came in. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Before we started the actual start of the recording, I I, I came in and and with the Who's uh, drum, roadie drum, what they call them, drum tech, tech. I suppose, <laughs> <laughs> a drum tech. Um, who was very sweet, and we set we set up everything, and I mic'd everything. So I thought, Glyn always liked a very very basic miking on on kits. He liked the, the air. He liked the thing to breathe. He didn't like close mic stuff at all. But I thought there's no way you can make this work unless you mic everything. So I I did kind of two micings on it, and I got it sounding really good with close mics, which and I left that up, and I thought, well, let's have Glyn, let's have Glyn listen to that. And then you've probably seen the story where Keith came in and just had a. He said, uh, "What does it sound like?" I said, "It sounds great, but you've not. I've not heard you play it yet." So he said, right, okay. Went in, played for part, you know, a quarter of an hour, and made, adjusted a few things. It all sounded great. And he stood up and said, "How's that?" And I said, "Fine." And he walked, and he just walked through the kit and sent every button <laughs> flying. <laughs> I thought, oh well, here we go. <laughs> yeah, all of these start again. <laughs> yeah, perfectly placed microphones that are all yeah unbelievably expensive. Yeah, to him, it's just stopping him do something. And we had to take the um, yeah, we had he had some syndromes on those sessions. We had to take them off in the end. Do do do, you know all that stuff. Really, like yeah. the electronic. electronic yeah, the first one. time we'd all heard them, but it was like driving us all mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Glyn said, find find a dustbin and put them in. <laughs> they are cool. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Limit limiting the syndrome is probably a good idea. You can't have. You it's can... not read the Who, is it? <laughs> no, no. But what was interesting listening to that album, Who Are You, was um, obviously the strings in it are incredible. The strings sound absolutely amazing. My dad. And yeah, yeah. yeah. So was that cool? Asking your dad to come and work on something that. Oh, well, Glenn had asked him. Yeah. Oh, had he? Yeah, because oh. he'd worked with Glenn before. He. he, um, he we we did uh, the rough mix stuff with Pete and Ronnie Lane, Pete Townsend and Ronnie Lane, and my dad had come in and done a string arrangement called Street in the City, and Glyn was completely blown away by this. It was just a, it was a beautiful piece, mm-hmm. and uh, and he went on and did some more stuff with Pete, which came out on Pete's solo records, um, much later, but then. He started to use my dad for the odd orchestra session. So when it came to putting strings, and this was quite early on, before obviously before Glyn left, he, we put strings on um, "Love Is Coming Down" and uh, "Had Enough," wasn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. on the on the album. Yeah, they're really amazing I, orchestration. And they were done in in the, in the big room at Olympic because uh, Ramport was too dead to do strings; it's too small. Ramport's where we recorded most of the album. Mm-hmm. We went to Rack Studios for a week. We, we went, I don't think we kept anything from there. And then we we Glyn mixed it once at um, Olympic, and then I mixed it, remixed it at CTS at Wembley um, because um, they wanted different mixes doing it. Mm-hmm. They weren't too happy. Right. And uh, what was also nice on that is the synths. There's a lot of synths. There's yeah. three or four tracks with some lush, lush synths. Was that was that Pete Townsend? That's Pete. Yeah, he 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 come in with demos with those all mostly on already. Um, he used the Yamaha CS80 a lot. The, the poly, poly synth. The Van uh, Gallis. Yeah. Synth. Yeah. And then um, John Entwistle had a um, a Moog, but it was polyphonic. It was the first polyphonic Moog I've come across. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what it's called. The poly Moog. I think Basically, it might be the poly yeah. yeah, but great synth sounds, really lovely. Um, my ears, my ears just tune into synths whenever I hear them, and uh, yeah, it was. I did a thesis on on synths when, in my last year of college. Did you? Yeah. Wow. What? And I met I met uh, um, Walter Carlos and um, and Miss and Moog. I met. He came over to London to demo his mini Moog, and after the the, the demo, I I sat with him and we talked about. Where it was it was going and and uh, we'd already had the Walter Carlos um, recordings of the Bach stuff, you know, switched mm-hmm. on the Bach, yeah, which was yeah. I think was fantastic. I loved it, mm. but it was uh, yeah, and and it's surprising how how much was being used. Then I I had an ARP uh, two thousand six hundred suitcase 
which Brilliant. was lovely. And uh, and Pete, of course, who are you? Is that the guitar is put through the uh, into the synth and it's doing uh, 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 so it's filtering and it's uh, panning. Really, yeah. the guitar. Yeah. Oh, cool. So, so it had an audio guitar. input. Yeah. On the synth. Oh, amazing. Synth, yeah. Yeah, I think those synths opened up a diff- a new sound, didn't they, for a lot of bands? Well, but the Beatles were using them, but you know, use it like a French horn or something. You wouldn't be. Able to, sometimes you come and listen to it, and you think that's not French horn, it's a synth. Uh, but but most people would just say, yeah, that, that's a French horn. Yeah. yeah, which is it's quite interesting. Then maybe to go onto the Fairlight because you picked up a Fairlight, which was a sort of a sampler synth, mm. um, wasn't it? What was what was that like when you first came across that? Um, the basic one was was um, was quite funny, I thought, which was a, like an eight track sequence with about a second of sampling, if if that. And it had, and of course, it had the orchestral stab on it, the sort of eight bit, whack, you know, yeah, <laughs> which everyone was using. And um, uh, and then I realised that, um, well, I played around with that and I used it on a few things. But really, it was my dad's toy. He loved it, and he he did lots of uh, he did he did some pieces on it actually, which are really nice. And and then MIDI came along, linked to it, which was like, oh, this is more interesting. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly they brought out this uh, the Mark III, which um, I just fell in love with, and um, I built up the RAM. So I had about I probably had more sampling than anybody else at the time. I had about fifteen sixteen seconds. Of, mm-hmm. of RAM sampling, so I could, suddenly I could do loops of drums or singing or guitar riffs. And on, on my first album, the guitar riff in, in the opening track is is a is a loop. It's it's a multi it's multi sampled, so I do, it's not the same each time it goes through. So that was quite fun to be able to do that sort of thing. And of course, I suddenly got booked for because I could fly in backing vocals from one chorus to another. And I so I was getting booked to do that sort of thing because no, you couldn't do that. You can only do it with tape, mm-hmm. and to do it with tape, it was like here it comes, bang, <laughs> all start again. It's a bit late. That's like we've all done on listening to the radio trying to tape the song <laughs> that you want off the radio, wasn't it? Like I oh, missed it. Missed it. it. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that sort of cut and paste. Uh, like in modern music, it's like that's like a keyboard shortcut to make the drum loop just go all the way through the track. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but incredible. I, no, I, was, I was programming drums like a drummer, so that if, if, it was a high, if it was a tom hit, then there was a hole in the hi-hat. So my drums became very, very real, and I had lots of multi-samples, dig drags, I had um, um, rim shots and bad rim shots. and <laughs> So, yeah, so it would sound like a drummer. In fact, um, I was talking to someone last night because um, they said, oh, you, I see you worked on... The Law, Paul, Paul Rogers, and uh, oh yeah, it was Kenny Jones. But anyway, yes. Yeah, so I sat down with him, and, and we sat and programmed everything together, right? Us- using, using his drums. Amazing. Yeah, that's good. It's what the producer wanted. Chris Kinsey, who, who produced the Stones and, and people at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you spoke about the Fairlight changing uh, the way that you made music, because studio time was off could often be uh, not very productive in a full day and it's cost you a thousand pounds to be in the studio so the Fairlight um, enabled you from what I've read it enabled you to work on stuff to map to map things out yeah yeah. certainly when I worked with Corey Hart in Canada we, we took the Fairlight and we went into the rehearsals and mapped everything out with we used the OBX quite a lot funny enough the, the uh, OBX mm-hmm. and um, the, the DMX I mean and um yeah, yeah, I had everything linked up in the studio later as well, so we could put the fair light down and use that as the the building block that every everything would be overdubbed to. And um, and it was quite nice in rehearsal because you can actually use you can use dynamics within a song rather than bang away as a song. You go, let's when it gets to the chorus, let's all go quiet. Mm. Everybody goes, you're joking. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> Trust me, try it. Yeah, we had a lot of success in North America with Corey Hart. He was never he was never known over here, but uh, 
Yeah, but even I do know that song, like Sunglasses at Night. I think it had a resurgence maybe around 2005. Yeah, they used it for an advert, didn't they? Oh, did I they? I think so, yeah. I remember DJs playing a song with that vocal on it, yeah. so I always thought that that was the original. That was about... funny, because he, he, he turned up on my doorstep here, funnily enough, Corey, and uh, he said, I want you to produce my next record. And I said, well, who are you? And he had little cassettes with him, so we sat down and, and I thought, well, this is great, the cheek of the guy. And I, could, I, I thought his voice was great, and I, but I thought the songs were so average. And that's what I told the management. So they said, well, why, why don't you write a song with him on just try it out so we did so yeah it was sunglass at night and we went to Manchester used all my guys in Manchester where I work a lot I used to work a lot and I drive Corey up and down the motorway and he, he said I've got, the, I've got the lyric I've got the lyric I've got the lyric do you speak American I said no no it's not no. try again Corey <laughs> and after about three journeys he went how about sunglass at night I said right that's good it so, is a, so, yeah, so. It's a great hook that is. I think I've had that in my head for like the last week since I first re- relived that song. <laughs> it really does stay in your head. And it's, it's and we a, ripped off the Eurythmics. It was Sweet Dreams, basically. Is it? Well, yeah, if you listen to the track, it's, it's a rip off from, from Sweet right. Dreams, yeah, which was a big hit at the time. It's a really enigmatic sort of lyric because there's, 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 there's definitely another side to it than the face value of just wearing your sunglasses at night. You know, it's yeah, it's really quite an yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's good. It was, uh, it was good fun, and we went off and did. We made a couple of albums together. Then he decided he wanted to produce himself, and that was it. He died. <laughs> really? But at, at the time, I said to him, "You've got to be very, very careful because you're you, you you're writing pop songs in Canada and North America." And you're appealing to your age group is very small. It's you know um, it's mid teens basically, and they're going to move on and find other stuff to listen to, and the people that come up aren't going to want to listen to you because they were listened to by their big brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. So you've really got to think about the songs and develop re- repertoire somewhat, and uh, and that's when he wrote Never Surrender, and we had big hit in, in America with that which was great but I, I knew he'd probably fizzle out because yeah producing for young... yourself is a different yeah. kettle of fish isn't it yeah. I always think that the Prodigy have done very well at I think their core market really has always been like teens late teens Yeah, and they've always tended to release things that are mainly aimed at that bracket so as I've got older I've sort of gone off their music a bit more even though I love I love Liam Howlett as a producer, you know, he's phenomenal. But I think they have done that quite well. They've sort of subtly kept their core the same age. Yeah. You know? Oh, they, well, they've also, it's quite different. They're not poppy, I would say, in any way. Whereas as Corey in his early days was pure pop, really. Mm. And it's, you know, listen to once and throw it away, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But your pop production is phenomenally good, like... That eighty sound that you that you created is it's such a perfect production. I don't know how, I don't know a better way of putting it than that. You know that era of 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 production. Um, because... Well, my second album, uh, funnily enough, when I when I my second solo album, that when I I went to Atlantic in New York to play it to everyone at the offices, and the A and R guys just said it's just too perfect. It's ridiculous. It's just, and then I found out that Pete Townsend had been using it for um, a studio reference disc, which is like a great accolade, you know. Yeah, what well, like a reference? A reference, yeah. Because, because he felt it, so it, it was this perfect sounding record, and uh, so he put stuff up against it and, and go, ah, oh, this is a bit boomy, or this is a bit shrill, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, wow. Uh, did you ask him for that in writing? Did you ever get that in writing? No. no. <laughs> I just heard that through someone else. But I never asked him about it. That's amazing. Is that your album, The Complete Angler? Is yeah. that the second one? Yeah. 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 Which has the perfect pop song in it, which is called The Menu. Right. <laughs> that's not one that's come, that I've come no. across. Yeah, your pop production is brilliant. And, um, so, you. yeah, what led, you, what led you to be in front of the camera and behind the mic? From from uh, from being a, an engineer and a producer, um, I didn't. I wasn't looking for it at all. Funnily enough, but um, 
I just finished working with Marilyn Martin and we'd written a couple of songs together and she had a hit with um, Separate Lives, it was a duet with Phil Collins that I didn't produce but suddenly they wanted an album doing and they came to me. Mm -hmm. And actually they wanted it so quickly they worked with about four different producers. So I did three with her. And um, and Atlantic, Armit Ertigan uh, just loved the production on the, on the stuff that we did with Marilyn. Atlantic in New York. And they said, um, would you consider ma you know, ma making a record yourself? You know, and I kind of went, oh, never even thought about that. And my, cousin, my manager was kind of kicking me under the desk. <laughs> I said, you don't even know I can sing. And they said, can you sing? I said, well, sort of. <laughs> it's brilliant. You, you clearly like, you're really taking any opportunity that came along, you know, just, yeah, why not, you know. Give it a go. Yeah, yeah. it's a really So I kind of philosophy. took a year off from producing and I wrote stuff and I had a um, Pete Townsend's barge moored on the river here, outside the house. So I, I went in there with my fair lights and machines and samplers. And I programmed everything up for the first album. And we had a hit in America with um, a song called Jane's Getting Serious, mm. which is on, it's on YouTube. It's yeah. And that was fun, and I, but I didn't want to tour. I didn't want to play. I didn't, you know, it was wasn't something I was really looking forward to doing. So I kind of ducked out. But they said they wanted another record, so I did a second one. For I did make a third, which I, I think only got released in, but not for Atlantic. I think it got released in Japan. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think there's there's an element of humour in your music. That that's you something might... you've got to be very careful with in America because. The musicians are a bit like actors, they're taken very seriously, the arts. And if you're too flippant, they kind of turn off you. Mm -hmm. So you, I think you've got to be very careful with that. It might have been a mistake with me, because in all my interviews were quite funny. And, you know, that I was known as the King of Quirk, that's what Atlantic called me. Really? For a while, you know, so I kind of went along with that. And it was like a sort of Thomas Dolby kind of thing going on, you know. Yeah, I mean, even the album title, uh, Everyone Loves the pilot. pilot Except the Crew, <laughs> that's just, that's a really funny album title, like, it's a great title, <laughs> and it's the true thing that I, no one's ever thought of before, <laughs> actually, yeah, maybe the crew don't like the pilot. <laughs> yeah, I think it's brilliant, uh, maybe, as Brit maybe as British people we have a bit more of a connection to the, the self-deprecation or the humour of exactly it. Exactly that, yes we do, and... Um, and yeah, the arts are taken very much, much more seriously, as I said, in America, where you're considered to be, have to take it very seriously. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, flippant lyrics and tongue-in-cheek stuff doesn't go down too well, really. It's the, it's the, it's the lack of irony, isn't it, they have. Yeah. But um, colleges all loved it, it was funny, because every, every college in them was playing my record to death. Really? So students loved it, but... Um, it was the mainline radio people who kind of went, mm, you know, is this serious or not, you know? It, that was, was it a bigger hit in America? It, oh, yeah. 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 So, yeah, you clearly did something, yeah, you clearly did something right that didn't go over overly funny or humorous. No. That, yeah. And I, I, mean, got, I got recognised for the first time in my life, which was a very odd thing, you know, going and checking to a hotel in New York, and they go, oh, Mr. Esley, and it's like, <laughs> what's all this about? And... Um, and I, MTV were fantastic because they made it a hit pick of the week. So they played it every hour for a week on the hour. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Yeah. That's really great. I think it's a very rare, you're a rare, a rare example of a producer who's crossed gone, over. yeah, who's crossed over to be, uh, yeah, had a solo career as well as doing the mastering. Um, normally you get, you get a type of person who's a producer or like yeah. that, that doesn't want to be in front of the camera, but it's great that you embrace that and you, you, I think it all it. helps, you know, the final thing as being a, a producer. If you're an artist for a short while, a lot of a lot of artists become producers, for sure. Mm -hmm. But to go from producing to art to um, to being an artist is 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 a bit unusual, I suppose. Definitely the wrong way around. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you have more like empathy with working with artists then, as a producer and mastering engineer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know how they feel about the music to a certain extent. Well, when I started mastering, which is probably in the 90s, I think, I can't remember roughly, um, 
Max Hole, who, who was the head of Universal Records here, said to me, oh, you'd be good at this because you've got a very good bedside manner. <laughs> I said, oh, OK. And uh, of course, what, what he meant was, you know, I, I can sit and talk to artists. And, that's good, yeah. And that's because of the background. and, and uh, Partly from being an artist and... And probably goes back to being a, a tea boy and knowing how to top up Eric Clapton's drink, you know, <laughs> as you do. Yeah, and yeah, and well, yeah, David Bowie, the yeah. Rolling Stones, the Eagles, is, yeah, yeah, incredible. Yeah, you said you started mastering in about in the mid nineties. I think so. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, the who came? The who. Uh, well, the who came to me and said, "Would I look after all their reissues?" So I said, "Okay." So I went into Polydor. We had meetings, and I said, "The problem I've got is a lot of the master tapes seem to be missing. I've since found them. Most of them were, were stuck in a, a library within a library in uh, <laughs> MCA in uh, in Los Angeles." Wow. But um, what the Who had were all copies, so and sometimes second generation, you know, third generation copies. So I said it's okay remastering from these, but we'd actually get a much better, a more interesting perspective if if Polydor would let me remix it. And Polydor went, "Wow, that's a great idea." Yeah. So we had most of the multi tracks. Some were missing. I think some of, uh, some of Who's next. They were thrown to a skip when when Virgin took over Olympic. They just threw all the tapes into a skip. Mm-hmm. As you do. <laughs> I dug out Isle of Wight eight track tapes out of that skip when I went past one day. Jimmy, yeah. Hen- Jimi Hendrix Isle of Wight tapes. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Which I subsequently gave back. But someone found so, so half the who's, who's Next tapes in there, but the other half were missing. So that one, that would never be remixed, and um, and a quick one. Kit, I think, burnt the masters after they finished the album in some sort of celebration. Really, that's the story. I, I don't know if it's true or not. Wow, yeah. that's a bit like the KLF burning a million pounds, isn't it? Like, yeah, <laughs> it probably seemed a good idea at the time. Yeah. <laughs> it seemed like quite a a renegade activity. Yeah, yeah, so, so yeah, you? and and then I went to um, to master what the remix is with Bob Ludwig, who's been a lifelong friend. He um, he's always mastered my productions, and um, when he was in New York, and he and then by this time he built his own place up in um, Maine, and so I went to visit him, and I took a couple of Who records that I'd, I'd remixed, and we did those with all the don't bonus tracks and stuff, and. I said, so what are you doing now? What are you adding there, Bob? And I was really, and he said, why don't you kind of like hang around for a bit if you want? So I did, and we went out for dinners and stuff, and um, and he, he, introduced, he introduced me to um, Daniel Weiss, who was a mad Swiss guy who builds mastering gear. And um, and Bob said, go, yeah, go home and do it now. So I went, okay, and I had a Sadie, which I used in the studio anyway which is a hard disk recorder. And I'd, I'd been using it just to compile albums on, really, and do editing on. Mm-hmm. And um, so I sat in here and I, and I tried stuff out. And then I went to Metropolis and did it again, like the ABBA stuff. I try it here and then I try it in Metropolis with a, a mastering engineer and I listened to the differences. And, and eventually I sort of got up the courage and, and, did, and started doing it properly. <laughs> Yeah, it takes a long time, I think, to understand what's going on digitally. So it's a funny medium. Absolutely, yeah. There's a lot of nuances and and details within the recordings and, and variables from one recording to the next. Sure. I remember reading about you having some difficulty with George Harrison recording that Phil Spector had done. Oh, well, the My Sweet Lord stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, the, the problem with it was that I'd, it, he came to me for remastering. I'm not sure why he didn't go to Abbey Road, but anyway, he came to me fine. And I did it once, and I delivered it, I delivered a CD over to him, and uh, he phoned up and said, it's, um, it's a little bit dull. I went, OK, no worries, I, I can sort that. So I did it again, just tweaked the top end, a bit more air into it. He said, no, it's still dull. And I said, you sure? He said, yeah, yeah. And um, did it again. And then, I, and then he phoned back after I did the third one and said, no, we like the first one. <laughs> so I said, come on, what's happened? And he said, oh, we had a tweet, a tweeter blown or something, I think. In his, uh, oh, really? In his studio. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah, Sweet it's... man, really sweet man. I, I, I miss him enormously. Yeah, he was a great guy. Yeah, yeah. There's some there's some stories where you've said it was a very simple process <clears throat> to master. For example, Catatonia, Paper Scissors Stone. Uh, it says you did that in one day, essentially. Well, mastering usually takes a day for an album. Um, you sometimes go back to it a day or two later and just tweak here and there. Um, but generally, the bulk of it can, of an album is done in a day. Yeah, it's not a protracted if it took any longer there's something wrong with the mixes basically yeah I was going to ask you about that I mean is there a point where you sometimes cross over to be a producer when someone delivers you something because oh, I've, you sent think... people, I've sent people back I've yeah. sent people home yes <laughs> <laughs> the tail between their legs um, I had there's a lovely story actually there's a girl I can't remember her name there's a girl an unsigned and she brought her little 17 year old mixing guy with her and um, and we sat and listened to it and I said um, it I really like this. I like the songs and everything, but it's not not very well recorded or mixed. So they kind of went. <gasps> so I said, "What? What do you mean?" So I said, "Well, the, the, dynamically, the vocal's far too enormous within the track. So you've got to learn how to, how to use a, I'm afraid, to con equipment to control the dynamics, compressors and limiters and stuff." Mm -hmm. And the little engineering boy is kind of listening to all this, and I said, "So." Gave him some list of plugins that he should try and and, uh, and told him about the track and what should be brought out and, and dynamically where they should go with it and um, and stereo and, and using stereo image a little bit better than they were and they went home and I thought and I didn't hear anything for a long time I thought oh well perhaps they gave up anyway she, she called me up a year later and came in and they sorted it all out. It was, it was really nice that uh, everything seemed to be taken on board. It worked beautifully. But yeah, that does happen. It's very rare I'll send them home to, to do the whole thing again. <laughs> yeah. But now and again, you get a track and you go, ah, you know, this, this vocal, I can't control it. It's just too shrill through this middle eight or something. Mm -hmm. I had one recently and, uh, and he did a little remix for me. Because when you start, when you master something and you, and you, you make it big and loud and fat and happening, all those things become can become very obvious, you know. If something's too bright or too shrill, all that, all those mid ranges. I mean, what the Americans do when they master, so they tend to just take all that middle out. Whereas English guys, English mustering guys, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Why um, do you think that is? Oh, it's just the way they work. I don't know. Maybe it's the way they they think everything is better because of it. Mm -hmm. It's a general, obviously, a big generalization. But I noticed that because I've remastered a lot of American products, actually tons of it, like even Toto and people, which has been great. Mm -hmm. um, They've had a bit of a resurgence very recently, haven't they? <laughs> There's one little label that I, I do probably two or three albums a month for. That's been going on since. You can imagine the amount of stuff I've done for them. It's enormous. And it's all American rock, and it's usually 80s. 70s or 80s. Inspired, yeah. Yeah. That's but then, no, it's all reissued. Re oh, it's reissued, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like I say, you're, the sound that you had in the 80s, that, that, the sound you created, that it's like mas you mastered it, you got exactly whatever r was required or wanted or like mm. made at that time. Absolutely fantastic. Do you, do you approach um, mastering differently? Uh, when you're given, if you're doing stem masterings like track masterings, I won't do that. Oh, you don't do that? No, because no. I'd end up spending all day remixing a track if I did that. I see. Yeah. So I, I want to hear it how they want it, wants to, how they imagine it finished. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I might 
say, go back and make the drums louder or something. But I'm, I'm not going to get into doing that. It just takes, it would take too long. Mm-hmm. And I'd lose, I'd lose my perspective as well. Yeah. Myself, you know, like we talked about earlier, where it's important the mastering engineer to hear something fresh, with fresh ears. And he can immediately go to where he feels um, it might benefit or it might be slightly better for for, for um, changing EQs or compressions or whatever. your process let's say for example a project comes in what's your what's your process the what once you've received the the song files what do you do i listen to it all flat the hop from start to finish always and actually a lot of people said no i don't know mastering engineers who do this because <laughs> it's you know you sit down for an hour sometimes with and before you even start work and it's and you get an, an, so you get an overall picture and make a few notes as it goes by. Oh, that track two's a bit boomy or whatever, you know, those sort of things. And then if, if I've got an artist here, I'll talk to them about the way I see it, and they go, great. And then I tend, not always, but I tend to use analog uh, valves and analog EQ, and valve EQ, and valve compression. And, um, and then I'll bring it back into digital to use multi-band digital um, compressors and tiny amounts of EQ, very narrow band sort of stuff, and um, and then record it back in alongside what they gave me. And I can A and B it as I do it, so I can hear the changes and what, what's being done. Yeah, I, and I liked what you said about the decisions, make a decision with perspective of perhaps a couple of days, um, burn the track to a CD and live with it, yeah, it's, good... it, it's nice to be able to um, I stick a CD in the car and go with it or whatever. But generally, I, I, in a, on a morning, I would come back, come back down in here the, the, within two days. Maybe maybe wait for a weekend and just listen through what I did. Mm-hmm. Generally, it's fine. It's funny enough. I just I did two tracks to a finished album this week. And listening to what I'd done before, it's, just, it's a tiny bit boomy, it's a tiny bit. I mean, talking... And um, I've asked them if I could... Uh, for them to check it and see what they think, yeah. So I might go back and do that. Mm-hmm. All revisions I do for free. I don't... I, it's something I... What you want to retain something together which is as perfect as you can. Um, and I just don't think you should be charging for that. You know, it's it's something that... You know, two or three. You know, if you don't get it right after two, two revisions, then there's something wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically, really wrong. Definitely. And yeah. um, um, what are those? The white pieces of equipment Vice. there that you pointed out. Um, this is a, a, a seven-band EQ unit. Um, you can get very, very narrow with it, and it's got also dynamic EQ in it. Um, mm-hmm. This I use for DSing, but also I use it for a dynamic EQ, so you can cho- choose a bandwidth. If you've got a vo- like if you've got a vocal that's really loud um, and a little bit piercing, you know, sort of around one k, two k, or something, mm-hmm. then you can dynamically you can just duck that around those frequencies whenever those come they come in. So it won't affect the track at all. It just leaves the track alone, and it only di- and dynamic will only affect the stuff that is above a certain level. I see. So yeah, for vo- for vocals and DSing and that sort of thing, this is great. For tiny amounts of EQ in very narrow fields, this is great. Mm-hmm. General EQ, I use. Um, gen- I I like to use the Manly, and um, which is quite broad EQ. And, and this this is a three band analog that was built by the, the guy from Polar Studios, who who, mm-hmm. who, who used to work with Ever. Oh, it's an outboard multiband. Outboard, yeah. Wow. That Which is very fantastic. nice. And 
this um, I tend to use the controlling bottom end more than anything. It's a it's a manly compressor. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Which is very nice. Um, what's the what's the what's that bo control box that you have? This is my it's my body control. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But you can monitor. Um, you can listen to. You can listen to the phase, you can cut left and right, you can listen to surround, you can um, actually assign different units into, um, into the chain. So it's got this, that's, a, that's a whole chain thing. Um, and this side is the monitoring. So you've got a lift button as well. When, at the, right at the end of a fade, it, it goes to, at the minus, I'm monitoring mm -hmm. minus 38, but it goes to minus six when I, or it can go even higher mm -hmm. when I um, press the lift button. Fantastic! It looks it looks like it could. It's like Geiger counter or something as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's just crispy. It's just I don't know. What, it's brilliant. I, I don't know what he was doing. Um, but you can listen to the extreme. I think she so you're only listening to the extreme of the stereo. Everything in the middle has been cut out. Right. So it's quite nice because you can hear. And then with M MS, you can actually EQ just those extremes if you want, or ex or just the middle if you want. So you can you can actually start to change quite dramatic things. Yeah. What? Why would you do that? In what situation? In what situation would you remove the center channel? Like, why would you go to? Do I wouldn't that? remove it. I'd, it's just for listening to to the extremes and thinking, mm, you know, they're a bit bright as they are there. Maybe reduce. Reduce that and then bring the echo because you can bring the echo down, of course. So you can actually start to change things that way as well because echo is stereo, but the voice, the voice isn't. Mm -hmm. So you could make a, vo a vocal drier by bringing the extremes down if you wanted to. <laughs> yeah, it's a brilliant way of working. I'd never thought about that because normally you do the center channel extraction if you want to take if you want to rip a vocal out of a track, you extract the center channel and you don't get the width stuff, but you make you get them vocal down the middle. Um, but that's a great way of working, and I guess that's a really good way of making space in a track or adding. Yeah, yeah, atmosphere. it's it's nice to it's nice to, if you've got something that's a little bit dull, um, but there's something quite bright in the middle, like a snare drum or something. You don't really want to alter. You can just lift this, the top ends of the extremes of the track, of the outside of the track. Incredible. Yeah. That's great. So yeah, it's ni nice little tricks like that are, <laughs> are, are quite good to do. Yeah, and um, do you find you're able to listen to an album or a song and identify what the mastering engineer's done to that? No, because you don't know what it was like before you got hold of it. Yeah. So that's a, definitely a... Definitely not, not no. <laughs> <laughs> but do you... So what for you would be, like, unless you've heard, Unless you've heard the tape, yeah. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I know for me, like, I pointed out, I spoke to a... Um, I spoke to a producer called Aid Fenton, who produced Gary Newman's last four albums, oh, right. and I, and he's about to release a new EP. And I said to him about the album, I was like, "Oh, it's brilliant because the the space that you've created, the stereo image that you've you've made there, was brilliant." And he said that was nothing to do with me; that was the mastering engineer. <laughs> so I sort of felt bad. I, I thought I thought I was going to compliment his new album he'd worked on. But the stereo imaging stuff was not done by the producer. It was done. Well, by yes, the you've got, you also have widening tools as well, um, which are, are all digital, I'm afraid. But there is, I think, Neve make a, a, an analog one, which I, I've always meant to look at, but never, mm -hmm. never really had a chance. Let me just um, let me just open up this. There we go. This is um, a bit of this is an isotope plugin. Oh, but yeah. you, um, the the widener here is actually really very usable. It's um, I can't really demo it at the moment because I've got I've got it set up. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so you can do things like that and widen widen stereo images. In fact, I, I did I did one recently where I felt the whole thing was a little bit mono, and they came back to me and said, "Don't use a widener." So I went, "Okay." Rule number one. I mean, I mean, it was quite subtle, I thought, but <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, I think that's one thing that surprised me when I've looked at the phase analysis of a track, say, like the Chemical Brothers, how thin it is 
until there's like splashes in effect that really widen it how how thin the the stereo image is i yeah. guess is that because it's just the way they worked yeah it punches more like it's it, it probably maybe yeah one way can do that Examples of incredible mastering that you, that you that you admire, or perhaps mas- mastering engineers who you know that really were. You? Well, Bob Ludwig has always been my go-to man. Who uh, well, Miles Miles um, at Abbey Road, Miles Showall at Abbey Road, is is pretty amazing, and very so particular because it, I, I think because his background is he loves working in vinyl, and you have to be so careful with vinyl. You have to take your time. Set it up properly. Check a little bit. Do a little test, you know, and have a look at it under a microscope. Make sure the grooves aren't touching at all. All that sort of thing. And and he and he takes his time and his care and everything else. And that's why his stuff sounds so amazing. Mm-hmm. He's uh, and all the equipment is. He 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 bought a lathe from the old EMI at Hayes that was been sitting in a in a shed for years. And it took them about eighteen months to rebuild it, get the parts because no one makes lathes anymore. Yeah, they're definitely yeah. And it's like press, it's like pressing machines. You know, uh, Optimal must have these old guys in coats with little oil cans keep, <laughs> keeping these things going because they they produce fantastic records. They're booked up like six months ahead mm-hmm. you know, for pressing vinyl, and no one's making pressing machines, so you, they have to be looked after and rebuilt every now and again. Definitely, it's yeah. like seeing tape in a studio. Um, yeah, there's a lot of maintenance that goes into it, but um, I guess you know people like that are really into the sound, and they know the benefits of of cutting to tape or recording to tape. Recording to tape, it. I think it's, I think it's had it. <laughs> Do you think? Yeah. I think if you're careful, a lot of people kind of think, "Oh, Pro Tools, great." It's the answer. And they record everything a little bit too loud. Americans don't. Americans keep the headroom. But um, I get a lot of recordings that have been made where things have been peaking. Not into zero, but... And so when they're mixed together, some of the some of the overtones, some of the, the like 5K area is going into... is peaking and going to distortion. Mm-hmm. Even though it's not showing zero. Because it, it's the overtones going into distortion. And... Um, and I think that's that's where you win with tape. You, you avoid that sort of thing happening. But if you're very careful, I've heard, I've heard sixty, you know, forty-four one recordings on Pro Tools that I, I thought was from tape. I'd, I thought the uh, I thought they'd been recorded on tape because mm-hmm. they've been so beautifully done. You know? Oh, I see. Right. So um, yeah. if care is taken, it can it can be perfect. Yeah. I mean. Listening to old stuff from tape is still great, obviously. Mm. It's funny, there's all these American little companies showing up now that will correct badly, bad tape azimuth and stuff and, uh, and uh, cut out biasing and all sorts of stuff. You know, it's like... Yeah, there's some really high tech stuff you can do now. There's even programs where you can throw. You can throw a whole a whole loop into a to a software program, and it'll take out the snare drum, the kick drum, the bass line. Yeah, which yeah, it's really phenomenal. Extraordinary sort that. of what you can do. do. Do you think? I mean, how has mastering changed since you started? Has that changed much? Yeah, because I was I started mastering actually. Maybe I was. I wonder when I could do the, the other stuff. I wonder if it was eighties. No, it can't have been. It must be nineties. Mastering in digital, when Metropolis set up, they they pinched three guys from great studios in London who'd had spent their life mastering to analog, mastering in analog, and they they all came together, put their heads together, and decided to build a studio for mastering in digital at Metropolis, and I was mm-hmm. there with them, and they borrowed my Sadie and they put, and we we tried some things out, mm-hmm. 
a guy called Chris Bidnay, who now works at Abbey Road, was very instrumental um, in what they bought, how they used it, that sort of thing, and, um, and, and what, what was going on digitally. So, in, yeah, in the early days, you kind of thought, when CDs and digital came along, you kind of thought, well, why, what's the mastering about anymore? Because it used to be that whole beautiful thing of getting it onto vinyl. When CD came along, it was about just... It wasn't in a, a volume thing, really. It was just balancing levels within a CD. So if track two came in a little bit quiet or a little bit dull or a little bit bright, then you, those are the adjustments you make. And then the loudness thing came along, as you say. And we, we all started to make everything far too loud. And, uh, and then since then, we backed off a bit. It's really funny, because I've just finished a, a five-CD set of um box set of the who sell out for release next year and the management everyone got copies and listened to it and everybody loves the sound of it and everything else and the management came back and said it was a little bit quiet and it's like mm, yeah but that's the beauty of being able to remaster these things is to let the dynamics be better but always got someone's got a an opinion yeah and it's difficult to hit that middle ground yeah that's what I did want to ask you um, surely like the label or the management surely they want it to be really loud sometimes to a degree sometimes and but, maybe but, but when, band, you, but when you remaster is, is there any point because you, you're trying to make something sound better yeah 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 that's true it's true I, yeah I did I did want to know yeah whether you felt like as a mastering engineer you're you're combating the loudness war because there must be external pressure for people to m make it louder. For example, DJs or you know people playing tracks in a club. I think I think that the main thing is that because uh, converters got better, um, and all all the gears got better, and you're now working at one nine two or ninety six k when you're doing the, the initial mastering before you bring it all down back down to forty four one horrible sixteen bit forty four one. Mm -hmm. You're um. Everything has got a lot, lot better. So that that's the that's the reason for remastering for me, not to make it louder, mm -hmm. just to make it clearer and nicer to, to listen to. Yeah. But, so, well, yeah. I think you're a very brave man because you've you've mastered you've remastered a lot of seminal records. Yeah. Uh, for ABBA, for Led Zeppelin, for the Who, for Rolling Stones. And, and I get slagged off. Exactly. You're a brave man because people, those original records are like, yeah. people will sort of remember their imperfections, don't they? Yeah. Um, but you're trying to make it as, as yeah, as, as good as, as good as it possibly can be. Yeah. So, yeah, do you feel I remember, sometimes... I remember, I remember the, all the ABBA brigade getting onto my back because I did some de-hissing, de de-noising on their stuff. You, because uh, the, the, some of the mix reels were a little bit hissy, but I only ever used it on the on the fades. And when I did an interview about it, I said oh, I, I used a little bit of denoising here and there. It was like <gasps> all the other guy kind of went, "Shit, this is terrible." Ashley's used denoising all over the new ABBA record. And, <laughs> yeah. and it really was like the last se second of the fade, you know. You know. <laughs> so you know it, that's the sort of thing that happens. It's, 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 it's bollocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I think. Um, yeah, maybe the best thing to do is remaster them and just don't say anything don't about say what's anything happened because then they can't pick up a, and and say, oh, it's multi band compressed it. That, you know, that's just not put my name on anything anymore. It's probably the best thing. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I think you're a brave guy for doing that, and obviously, supremely talented to be doing what well, the, the are essentially the biggest act in the world. Yeah, and and the feedback from from the the the, 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 the artists has always been very very positive. Always. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what you, you're working for them and the label. You're not working for. They're the people that pay me. They're, I do a, do a job for them. It's they, a very good their point. job is to go out and sell it, and <laughs> keep everyone happy. <laughs> um, yeah, um, yeah. Just going back to what you remastered. The other one was the Who Live in Leeds, which you did, and you removed the crackles from it. <laughs> um, and. There's a quote on the, the CD, isn't there, where it said... Crack, crackles are removed on purpose. Yeah, yeah, as, yeah as, you did that on purpose, because <laughs> the original one said something about the crackles. Crackles were, are meant. The crackles are intended, yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's brilliant. Do you know how that happened, the crackles? Uh, no. no. Oh, it's, um, Lisa's very funny, because they, 
they built a little control room and with one eight track machine, um, two floors below the um, the common room, the student union mm. common room, and um, well, had all the cables going down to it, and there was a loose plug on stage, and this plug just kept shorting, <laughs> crackle, crackle, really? crackle, bang, bang, crackle, crackle. <laughs> And um, it and it's only on every alternative track on the eight track. It's very odd. It's like on the the kick drum, on the guitar, but the bass drum and the, and the snare and everything are fine. And it's it's really very strange that uh, it, the, the way it came out. Removing it was a nightmare because there are D click software things, and it's, you just run it through that and it's fine. You kind of go, oh, that's better. And then you realise you've taken off the plectrum off the guitar. Right. Yeah. So you yeah. have to go through and choose which bit of audio you're going to use, and to paste it all up. Do yeah. it selectively. Yeah. And yeah. the same, the same with, with all everything that you've declipped. You have to be very careful. I guess okay then let's talk about your um the mastering service that you offer for unsigned artists uh, unsigned artists yeah um yeah it's a fantastic thing so yeah can you describe how that started or? it started when sound on sound came to me and said would i um be offer a prize in a competition so i said yeah i can do that so i said what's what's going to happen they said well we'll collect up people's home tapes and we'll send you the best ones that we we think you know when they sent me hundreds it was like <laughs> so I was in the back of the car going <laughs> yeah. it was like, Dri- the, skip, to like the skip with the Rolling Stones reels yeah it was, back, it was the back seat you know <laughs> oh this is good and um, and I picked three or four I think and so they became winners and they came and had a they all came together and had a day with me here and I, and I did their tracks for them and explained what the mastering side was. And I thought, oh, this is a great big untapped market here, which um, people really do need help. They can't afford, you know, if you send something to Abbey Road or Metropolis, I think it's about £100 a track, and you may get a good engineer doing it. Generally, I think at Abbey Road you do, but um, you may get the the T-boy doing it. Mm-hmm. You, you never know. And it may not be what you want, and there's no comeback. So I thought, well, let's let's get them in here or let's get them sent here and start this whole thing and I, I, I tend to do about one a week I don't I don't try and do too much of it but because um, I'm a bit busy with other stuff mm-hmm. um, and but yeah it, it's it's very very nice to do and you find people and, all, and now and again I've placed people with record companies as well which has been great it's very, it's very um, fulfilling and so how, if there's someone listening who makes music and they want to send you their stuff, what sort of format do you require in? What sort of shape? I'll just email, just email me and then I'll talk to them and let them know. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's stereo mix files basically that I, like, I work for. But um, if it's an album, they're very welcome to come and, uh, and sit in and do it with me as well. Oh, that's really good. Yeah. That's amazing. And yeah, so how, how do you feel? Because I know I've personally used master. Uh, some people have mastered some of my tracks in the past. I've also used online mastering. Um, how do you feel about those sort of online services? I don't know. I've never tried them. I don't know. I don't know what they're like. Because I know for me as a punter, having used them, it felt like a very impersonal yeah. process. Yeah. Uh, using a company who who just master it with a little bit of text. Um, it was so much more wholesome to have a guy that I knew who was working on it and I could just come in and go make it sound more punk and then leave and then come back and know that it was a bit more edgy and it had a bit more rawness yeah, to it. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I think, yeah, losing the human element in this sort of part of the process is it's not... Sad, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. not a good... Yeah. Not not really good, yeah. It's, you don't, it's not a two-way, two-way thing. Well, certainly the word of mouth thing happens a lot with what I'm doing. I, in Ireland, it's extraordinary. I think I've, I'm doing tra- traditional Irish music, you know, every every other week, you know. and it's just word of mouth, you know, people because they all they all play together, they all know each other in Ireland. Mm-hmm. 
And they used to like, oh, send it to Germany. Really? Yeah. And I love, I love traditional Irish music. And I think it's a, it's a nice rest, a rest day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember seeing a band called Flogging Molly who played, uh, they supported a band called The Hives, yeah. a Swedish band. Yeah. And I've never been so impressed with a live band, like their sound. Great players. Yeah. Always great fantastic. players. Fantastic. Yeah. So much energy. Yeah. Um, and I'm really from an electronic music background, so yeah, the energy that was on stage was just mind-blowing compared to, compared to what I was used to. For, for someone who wanted to try mastering uh, at home. At home. Um, what what would be your sort of tips for them? What to, for plugins? Yeah, do we just uh, just general advice on. Well, Dan, me- Daniel Vice makes a thing called Nem M One now, which is a, a really nice plugin, and it's got it's got presets in it which are, are great, um, and you can control the amount of it's it's um, a compressor limiter, and you can control the amount of compression you want to use. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a punch button on it, and that, as you use more and more of it mm-hmm. um, the drums don't get quieter it's, ext- <laughs> it's an extraordinary piece of gear <laughs> a, I don't, it, don't, it just lets it through you know it's amazing um, so that's yeah I'd, I'd recommend that to anybody to, if they want to master at home mm-hmm. just bung it through that it's like a lot of people were using the L3 uh, the waves for for years and years when so it's just to bring their masters up to their mixes up to a mastering level, mm-hmm. but I'd, I'd use and this is now kind of superseded it. It's a nice piece of gear. Yeah, and do do you think when someone submits uh, their track to you to be mastered, should they have no effect on their master channel? Um, that depends a lot. Um, if it's something that they like the sound of that's affecting the whole track, then yes, by all means, use it. Don't overdo it. That's that's always what I say. If it, if they want something, they can always send me both. Mm-hmm. Without the stereo bus, and with the stereo bus, and then I can pick and choose which one to use. But if they, very often I'll get sent um, commercially um, something the engineer has done as a listening copy. Which people love, mm-hmm. and so I can A and B what I'm going to master against that right. sometimes, which is quite quite useful, because um, it means that they he's got a volume that's they're happy with, so you don't have to go necessarily any louder than that, which is great, and it gives you an idea. Um, but usually they just use it like an M and one or an, an, an uh, Waves L, you know L three or something, L two. Mm-hmm. I think the um, solid state logic compressor on on the stereo bus or limiter is very nice but it's just don't go mad with it you know if it's doing something yeah be just be careful when you a and b it yourself before you before you use it mm-hmm. if it's starting to di- affect the dynamics too much then don't use it mm-hmm. great okay thank you very much john thanks Pleasure. for talking to me it's been great to speak to you Wow, what a career that guy's had. Uh, he's worked with so many people. There was, a, there was a shelf of CDs in the room we were talking in, which is all of the stuff he's mastered. And um, uh, I, it just it knocked my socks off seeing so many artists that I know and love that he's worked for. Incredible, incredible guy. And do use his mastering service. I, uh, I recently had a track done uh, by him. And uh, it sounded amazing when he sent it back to me. He is really a master of what he does. Right, next month we are talking about techie stuff. We're talking about synths, products, gear. From a guy who's worked for a very, very, very popular British uh, manufacturer, a very big British manufacturer for a number of years. Uh, He also plays live, and we're going to talk to him next month, which will be probably 2019 now, so look out for that one soon. I'm Midiera, thank you very much for listening, I'll see you again soon.